Section 34 of The Naval Officer, or Scenes in the Life and Adventures of Frank Mildmay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Asterix. The Naval Officer, or Scenes in the Life and Adventures of Frank Mildmay, by Captain Frederick Marriott chapter twenty seven fare thee well and if for ever still for ever fare thee well even though unforgiving never gainst thee shall my heart rebel byron i was so stunned with this contretemps that i fell senseless to the ground and it was long before the kind attentions and assiduity of eugenia could restore me when she had succeeded my first act was one of base ingratitude cruelty and injustice i spurned her from me and upbraided her as the cause of my unfortunate situation she only replied with tears i quitted her and the child without bidding them adieu little thinking i should never see them again i ran to the inn where i had left my horse mounted and rode back to blank hall mr somerville and his daughter had just arrived and emily was lifted off her horse and obliged to be carried up to her room clara and talbot came to inquire what had happened i could give no account of it but earnestly requested to see emily the answer returned was that miss somerville declined seeing me in the course of this day which in point of mental suffering exceeded all i had ever endured in the utmost severity of professional hardship an explanation had taken place between myself my father and mr somerville i had done that by the impulse of dire necessity which i ought to have done at first of my own free will i was caught at last in my own snare the trains of the devil are long said i to myself but they are sure to blow up at last the consequence of the explanation was my final dismissal and a return of all the presents which my father and myself had given to emily my conduct though blamable was not viewed in that heinous light either by my father or mr somerville and both of them did all that could be done to restore harmony Clara and Talbot interposed their kind offices, but with no better success. The maiden pride of the inexorable Emily had been alarmed by a beautiful rival with a young family in the next village. The impression had taken hold of her spotless mind and could not be removed. I was false, fickle, and deceitful and was given to understand that miss somerville did not intend to quit her room until she was assured by her father that i was no longer a guest in the house under these painful circumstances our remaining any longer at the hall was both useless and irksome a source of misery to all my father ordered his horses the next morning and i was carried back to london more dead than alive a burning fever raged in my blood and the moment i reached my father's house i was put to bed and placed under the care of a physician with nurses to watch me night and day for three weeks i was in a state of delirium and when i regained my senses it was only to renew the anguish which had caused my disorder and i felt any sentiment except gratitude for my recovery my dear clara had never quitted me during my confinement i had taken no medicine but from her hand i asked her to give me some account of what had happened she told me that talbot was gone that my father had seen mr somerville who had informed him that emily had received a long letter from eugenia narrating every circumstance exculpating me and accusing herself emily had wept over it but still remained firm in her resolution never to see me more and i am afraid my dear brother said clara that her resolution will not be very easily altered you know her character and you should know something about our sex but sailors they say go round the world without going into it this is the only shadow of an excuse i can form for you 
much as i love and esteem you you have hurt emily in the nicest point that in which we are all the most susceptible of injury you have wounded her pride which our sex rarely if ever forgive at the very moment she supposed you were devoted to her that you were wrapped up in the anticipation of calling her your own and counting the minutes with impatience until the happy day arrived with all this persuasion on her mind she comes upon you as the traveller out of the woods suddenly comes upon the poisonous snake in his path and cannot avoid it she found you locked hand in hand with another a fortnight before marriage and with the fruits of unlawful love in your arms what woman could forgive this i would not i assure you if tol i mean if any man were to serve me so i would tear him from my heart even if the dissolution of the whole frame was to be the certain consequence i consider it a kindness to tell you frank that you have no hope much as you have and will suffer she poor girl will suffer more and although she will never accept you she will not let your place be supplied by another but sink broken-hearted into her grave you like all other men will forget this but what a warning ought it to be to you that sooner or later guilt will be productive of misery this you have fully proved your licentious conduct with this woman has ruined her peace for ever, and divine vengeance has dashed from your lips the cup which contained as much happiness as this world could afford. Nor has the penalty fallen on you alone. The innocent, who had no share in the crime, are partakers in the punishment. We are all as miserable as yourself, but God's will be done, continued she as she kissed my aching forehead and her tears fell on my face how heavenly is the love of a sister towards a brother clara was now everything to me having said thus much to me on the subject of my fault and it must be confessed that she had not been niggardly in the article of words she never named the subject again but sought by every means in her power to amuse and to comfort me she listened to my exculpation she admitted that our meeting at bordeaux was as unpremeditated as it was unfortunate she condemned the imprudence of our travelling together and still more the choice of a residence for eugenia and her son clara's affectionate attention and kind efforts were unavailing i told her so and that all hopes of happiness for me in this world were gone for ever my dear dear brother said the affectionate girl answer me one question did you ever pray my answer will pretty well explain to the reader the sort of religion mine was why clara said i to tell you the truth though i may not exactly pray as you call it yet words are nothing i feel grateful to the almighty for his favours when he bestows them on me and i believe a grateful heart is all he requires then brother how do you feel when he afflicts you that i have nothing to thank him for answered i then my dear frank that is not religion maybe so said i but i am in no humour to feel otherwise at present so pray drop the subject she burst into tears this said she is worse than all shall we receive good from the hand of the lord and shall we not receive evil but seeing that i was in that sullen and untamable state of mind she did not venture to renew the subject as soon as i was able to quit my room i had a long conversation with my father who though deeply concerned for my happiness said he was quite certain that any attempt at reconciliation would be useless he therefore proposed two plans and i might adopt whichever was the most likely to divert my mind from my heavy affliction the first was to ask his friends at the admiralty to give me the command of a sloop of war the second that i should go upon the continent and having passed a year there return to england when there was no knowing what change of sentiment time and absence might not produce in my favour for said he there is one very remarkable difference in the heart of a man and of a woman in the first absence is very often a cure for love in the other 
it more frequently cements and consolidates it in your absence emily will dwell on the bright parts of your character and forget its blemishes the experiment is worth making and it is the only way which offers a chance of success i agreed to this but said i as the war with france is now over and that with america will be terminated no doubt very shortly i have no wish to put you to the expense or myself to the trouble of fitting out a sloop of war in time of peace to be a pleasure yacht for great lords and ladies and myself to be neither more or less than a maitre d'hôtel and after having spent your money and mine and exhausted all my civilities to receive no thanks and hear that i am esteemed at almack's only a tolerable sea brute enough a ship therefore continued i i will not have and as i think the continent holds out some novelty at least i will with your consent set off this point being settled i told clara of it the poor girl's grief was immoderate my dearest brother i shall lose you and be left alone in the world your impetuous and unruly heart is not in a state to be trusted among the gay and frivolous french you will be at sea without your compass you have thrown religion overboard and what is to guide you in the hour of trial fear not dear clara said i my own energies will always extricate me from the dangers you apprehend alas it is these very energies which i dread said clara but i trust that all will be for the best accept said she of this little book from poor broken-hearted clara and if you love her look at it sometimes i took the book and embracing her affectionately assured her that for her sake i would read it when i had completed my arrangements for my foreign tour i determined to take one last look at blank hall before i left england i set off unknown to my family and contrived to be near the boundaries of the park by dusk i desired the post-boy to stop half a mile from the house and to wait my return i cleared the paling and avoiding the direct road came up to the house the room usually occupied by the family was on the ground floor and i cautiously approached the window mr somerville and emily were both there he was reading aloud she sat at the table with a book before her but her thoughts it was evident were not there she had inserted her taper fingers into the ringlets of her hair until the palms of her hand reached her forehead then bending her head towards the table she leaned on her elbows and seemed absorbed in the most melancholy reflections this too is my work said i this fair flower is blighted and withering by the contagious touch of my baneful hand good heaven what a wretch i am whoever loves me is rewarded by misery and what have i gained by this wide waste and devastation which my wickedness has spread around me happiness no no that i have lost for ever would that my loss were all would that comfort might visit the soul of this fair creature and another but i dare not i cannot pray i am at enmity with god and man yet i will make an effort in favour of this victim of my baseness o oh god continued i if the prayers of an outcast like me can find acceptance not for myself but for her i ask that peace which the world cannot give shower down thy blessings upon her alleviate her sorrows and erase from her memory the existence of such a being as myself let not my hateful image hang as a blight upon her beauteous frame emily resumed her book when her father had ceased reading aloud and i saw her wipe a tear from her cheek the excitement occasioned by this scene added to my previous illness from the effects of which i had not sufficiently recovered caused a faintness i sat down under the window in hopes that it would pass off it did not however for i fell and lay on the turf in a state of insensibility which must have lasted nearly half an hour 
i afterwards learned from clara that emily had opened the window it being a french one to walk out and recover herself by the bright moonlight she perceived me lying on the ground her first idea was that i had committed suicide and with this impression she shut the window and tottering to the back part of the room fainted her father ran to her assistance and she fell into his arms she was taken up to her room and consigned to the care of her woman who put her to bed but she was unable to give any account of herself or the cause of her disorder until the following day for my own part i gradually came to my senses and with difficulty regained my chaise the driver of which told me i had been gone about an hour i drove off to town wholly unaware that i had been observed by any one much less by emily when she related to her father what she had seen he either disbelieved or affected to disbelieve it and treated it as the effects of a distempered mind the phantoms of a disordered imagination and she at length began to coincide with him i started for the continent a few days afterwards talbot who had seen little of clara since my rejection by emily and subsequent illness offered my father to accompany me and clara was anxious that he should go as she was determined not to listen to anything he could say during my affliction she could not she said be happy while i was miserable and gave him no opportunity of conversing with her on the subject of their union we arrived at paris but so abstracted was i in thought that i neither saw nor heard anything every attention of talbot was lost upon me i continued in my sullen stupor and forgot to read the little book which dear clara had given and which for her sake i had promised to read i wrote to eugenia on my arrival and disburthened my mind in some measure by acknowledging my shameful treatment of her i implored her pardon and by return of post received it her answer was affectionate and consoling but she stated that her spirits of course were low and her health but indifferent for many days my mind remained in a state of listless inanity and talbot applied or suffered others to apply the most pernicious stimulant that could be thought of to rouse me to action taking a quiet walk with him we met some friends of his and at their request we agreed to go to the saloons of the palais royal this was a desperate remedy and by a miracle only was i saved from utter and irretrievable ruin how many of my countrymen have fallen victims to the arts practised in that horrible school of vice i dare not say happy should i be to think that the infection had not reached our own shores and found patrons among the great men of the land they have however both felt the consequences and been forewarned of the danger they have no excuse mine was that i had been excluded from the society of those i loved always living by excitement was it surprising that when a gaming-table displayed its hordes before me i should have fallen at once into the snare for the first time since my illness i became interested and laid down my money on those aboard tables my success was variable but i congratulated myself that at length i had found a stimulus and i anxiously awaited the return of the hour when the doors would again be opened and the rooms lighted up for the reception of company i won considerably and night after night found me at the table for avarice is insatiable but my good luck left me and then the same motive induced me to return with the hope of winning back what i had lost still fortune was unpropitious and i lost very considerable sums i became desperate and drew largely on my father he wrote to beg that i would be more moderate as twice his income would not support such an expenditure he wrote also to talbot who informed him in what manner the money had been expended and that he had in vain endeavoured to divert me from the fatal practice finding that no limits were likely to be put to my folly my father very properly refused to honour any more of my bills 
Maddened with this information, for which I secretly blamed Talbot, I drew upon Eugenia's banker, bill after bill, until the sum amounted to more than what my father had paid. At length a letter came from Eugenia. It was but a few lines. I know too well, my dearest friend, said she, what becomes of the money you have received. If you want it all, I cannot refuse you, but remember that you are throwing away the property of your child. This letter did more to rouse me to a sense of my infamous conduct than the advice of Talbot or the admonitions of my father. I felt I was acting like a scoundrel, and I resolved to leave off gaming. One night more, said I, and then, if I lose, there is an end of it. I go no more. Talbot attended me. He felt he was in some measure the cause of my being first initiated in this pernicious amusement, and he watched my motions with unceasing anxiety. The game was rouge et noir. I threw a large sum on the red. I won, left the stake, doubled, and won again. The heap of gold had increased to a large size, and still remained to abide the chance of the card. Again, again, and again it was doubled. Seven times had the red card been turned up, and seven times had my gold been doubled. Talbot, who stood behind me, implored and begged me earnestly to leave off. What may be the consequence of one card against you? Trust no more to fortune. Be content with what you have got. That, muttered I, Talbot, is of no use. I must have more. Again came up the red, to the astonishment of the bystanders, and to their still greater astonishment, my gold, which had increased to an enormous heap, still remained on the table. Talbot again entreated me not to tempt fortune foolishly. Folly, said I, Talbot, has already been committed, and one more card will do the business. It must be done. The bankers, knowing after eight red cards had been turned up, how great the chance was of regaining all their losses by a double or quits, agreed to the ninth card. Talbot trembled like a leaf. The card was turned. It came up red, and the bank was broke. Here all play ceased for that night. The losers, of course, vented their feelings in the most blasphemous execrations, while I quietly collected all my winnings, and returned home in a fiacre with Talbot, who took the precaution of requesting the attendance of two gendarmes. These were each rewarded with a Napoleon. Now, Talbot, said I, I solemnly swear, as I hope to go to heaven, never to play again, and this promise I have most religiously kept. My good fortune was one instance in ten thousand among those who have been ruined in that house. The next morning I refunded all I had drawn upon Eugenia, and all my father had supplied me with, and there still remained a considerable residue. Determined not to continue in this vortex of dissipation any longer, where my resolution was hourly put to the test, Talbot and myself agreed to travel down to Brest, an arsenal we were both desirous of seeing. End of chapter 27「Section 35 of the Naval Officer – or scenes in the life and adventures of Frank Mildmay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Asterix. The Naval Officer. Or scenes in the life and adventures of Frank Mildmay by Captain Frederick Marriott. Chapter 28. Palamon. Thou art a traitor, Arcite, and a fellow, false as thy title to her. Friendship, blood, and all the ties between us, I disclaim. Arcite, you are mad. Palamon, I must be till thou art worthy, Arcite. It concerns me, and in this madness, if I hazard thee and take thy life, I deal but truly. Arcite, fie, sir! Two noble kimen. We quitted Paris two days after, 
and a journey of three days through an uninteresting country brought us to the little town of Granville on the sea coast in the channel we remained at this delightful place some days and our letters being regularly forwarded to us brought us intelligence from england my father expressed his astonishment at my returning the money drawn for and trusted unaccountable as the restitution appeared that i was not offended and would consider him my banker as far as his expenditure and style of living would permit him to advance eugenia in her letters reproached herself for having written to me and concluded that i had drawn so largely upon her merely to prove her sincerity she assured me that her caution to me was not dictated by selfishness but from a consideration for the child clara's letter informed me that every attempt even to servility had been made in order to induce emily to alter her determination but without success and that a coolness had in consequence taken place and almost an entire interruption of the intimacy between the families she also added i am afraid that your friend is even worse than yourself for i understand that he is engaged to another woman and has been so for years now as i must consider that the great tie of your intimacy is his supposed partiality to me and as i conceive you are under a false impression with respect to his sincerity i think it my duty to make you acquainted with all i know it is impossible that you can esteem the man who has trifled with the feelings of your sister and i sincerely hope that the next letter from you will inform me of your having separated how little did poor clara think when she wrote this letter of the consequences likely to arise from it that in thus venting her complaints she was exploding a mine which was to produce results ten times more fatal than anything which had yet befallen us i was at this period in a misanthropic state of mind hating myself and every one about me the company of talbot had long been endured not enjoyed and i would gladly have availed myself of any plausible excuse for a separation true he was my friend had proved himself so but i was in no humour to acknowledge favours discarded by her i loved i discarded every one else talbot was a log and a chain and i thought i could not get rid of him too soon this letter therefore gave me a fair opportunity of venting my spleen but instead of a cool dismissal as clara requested i determined to dismiss him or myself to another world having finished reading my letter i laid it down and made no observation talbot with his usual kind and benevolent countenance inquired if i had any news yes i replied i have discovered that you are a villain that is news indeed said he and strange that the brother of clara should have been the messenger to convey it but this is language frank which not even your unhappy state of mind can excuse retract your words i repeat them said i you have trifled with my sister and are a villain had this been true it was no more than i had done myself but my victims had no brothers to avenge their wrongs the name of clara replied talbot calms me believe me frank you are mistaken i love her and have always had the most honourable intentions towards her yes said i with a sarcastic sneer at the time that you have been engaged to another woman for years to one or the other you must acknowledge yourself a scoundrel i do not therefore withdraw my appellation but repeat it and as you seem so very patient under injuries i inform you that you must either meet me on the sands this evening or consent to be stigmatized with another name still more revolting to the feelings of an englishman enough enough frank said talbot with a face in which conscious innocence and manly fortitude were blended you have said more than i ever expected to have heard from you and more than the customs of the world will allow me to put up with what must be must be but i still tell you frank that you are wrong 
that you are fatally deluded, and that you will bitterly repent the follies of this day. It is yourself with whom you are angry, and you are venting that anger on your friend. The words were thrown away on me. I felt a secret, malignant pleasure which blindly impelled me forward with the certainty of glutting my revenge by either destroying or being destroyed. My sole preparation for this dreadful conflict was my pistols. No other did I think of, not even the chances of sending my friend and fellow mortal, or going myself, into the presence of an almighty judge. My mind was absorbed in secret pleasure at the idea of that acute misery which Emily would suffer if I fell by the hand of Talbot. I repaired to the rendezvous where I found Talbot waiting. He came up to me and again said, Frank, I call heaven to witness that you are mistaken. You are wrong. Suspend your opinion at least, if you will not recall your words. Totally possessed by the devil, and not to be convinced till too late, I replied to his peaceful overture by the most insulting irony. You are not afraid to fire at a poor boy in the water, said I though you do not like to stand a shot in return. Come, come, take your ground, be a man, stand up, don't be afraid. For myself, said Talbot, with a firm and placid resignation of countenance, I have no fears, but for you, Frank, I have great cause of alarm. So saying, he snatched up the loaded pistol, which I threw down to him. We had no seconds, nor was there any person in sight. It was a bright moonlight, and we walked to the water's edge, where the reflux of the tide had left the sand firm to the tread. Here we stood back to back. The usual distance was fourteen paces. Talbot refused to measure his, but stood perfectly still. I walked ten paces and turned round. Ready, said I, in a low voice. We both raised our arms, but Talbot, instantly dropping the muzzle of his pistol, said, I cannot fire at the brother of Clara. I can at her insult her, answered I, and taking deliberate aim, fired, and my ball entered his side. He bounded, gave a half turn round in the air, and fell on his face to the ground. How sudden are the transitions of the human mind! How close does remorse follow the gratification of revenge? The veil dropped from my eyes. I saw in an instant the false medium, the deceitful vision, which had thus allured me into what the world calls an affair of honour. Honour, good heaven, had made me a murderer, and the voice of my brother's blood cried out for vengeance. The manly and athletic form, which one minute before excited my most malignant hatred, when now prostrate and speechless, became an object of frantic affection. I ran to Talbot, and when it was too late, perceived the mischief I had done. Murder, cruelty, injustice, and above all the most detestable ingratitude flashed at once into my overcrowded imagination. I turned the body round, and tried to discover if there were any signs of life. A small stream of blood ran from his side, and about two feet from him was lost in the absorbing sand, while from the violence of his fall the sand had filled his mouth and nostrils. I cleaned them out, and staunching the wound with my handkerchief, for the blood flowed copiously at every respiration, I sat on the seashore by his side, supporting him in my arms, I only exclaimed, Would to God the shark, the poison, the sword of the enemy, or the precipice of Trinidad, had destroyed me before this fatal hour. Talbot opened his languid eyes, and fixed them on me with a glassy stare, but he did not speak. Suddenly recollection seemed for a moment to return. He recognized me, and, oh God, his look of kindness pierced my heart. He made several efforts to speak, and at last said in broken accents, and at long and painful intervals, Look at letter. Writing desk. Read all. Explain. God bless. His head fell back, and he was dead. 
oh how i envied him had he been ten thousand times more guilty than i had ever supposed him it would have given no comfort to my mind i had murdered him and too late i acknowledged his innocence i know not why and can scarcely tell how i did it but i took off my neckcloth and bound it tightly round his waist over the wound the blood ceased to flow i left the body and returned to our lodging in a state of mental prostration and misery proportioned to the heat and excitement with which i had quitted it my first object was to read the letters which my poor friend had referred to on my arrival both our servants were up my hands and clothes were dyed with blood and they looked at me with astonishment i ran hastily upstairs to avoid them and took the writing-desk the key of which i knew hung to his watch-chain seizing the poker i split it apart and took out the packet he mentioned at this moment his servant entered the room et mon maître monsieur où est-il i have murdered him said i and you will find him in the sands near the signal post and continued i i am now robbing him my appearance and actions seemed to prove the truth of my assertion the man flew out of the room but i was regardless of everything and even wonder why i should have given my attention to the letters at all especially as i had now convinced myself of talbot's innocence the packet however i did read and it consisted of a series of letters between talbot and his father who had engaged him to a young lady of rank and fortune without consulting him une mariage de convenance which talbot had resisted in consequence of his attachment to clara i have already stated that talbot was of high aristocratic family and this marriage being wished for by the parents of both parties they had given it out as being finally settled to take place on the return of talbot to england in the last letter his father had yielded to his entreaties in favour of clara only requesting him not to be precipitate in offering himself as he wished to find some excuse for breaking off the match and above all he fatally enjoined profound secrecy till the affair was arranged here then was everything explained indeed before i had read these letters my mind did not need this damning proof of his innocence and my guilt just as i had finished reading the gendarme entered my room and with the officers of justice led me away to prison i walked mechanically i was conducted to a small building in the centre of a square this was a cachot with an iron grated window on each of its four sides but without glass there was no bench or table or anything but the bare walls and the pavement the wind blew sharply through i had not even a greatcoat but i felt no cold or personal inconvenience for my mind was too much occupied by superior misery the door closed on me and i heard the bolts turn there was not an observation made on either part and i was left to myself well said i fate has now done its worst and fortune will be weary at last of tormenting a wretch that she can sink no lower death has no terrors for me and after death but even in my misery i scarcely gave a thought to what might happen in futurity it might occasionally have obtruded itself on my mind but was quickly dismissed i had adopted the atheistical creed of the french revolution death is eternal sleep and the sooner i go to sleep the better thought i the only point that pressed itself on my mind was the dread of a public execution this my pride revolted at for pride had again returned and resumed its empire even in my cachot as the day dawned the noise of the carts and country people coming into the square with their produce roused me from my reverie for i had not slept the prison was surrounded by all ages and all classes to get a sight of the english murderer and the light and the air were stopped 
out of each window by human faces pressed against the bars. I was gazed at as a wild beast, and the children, as they sat on their mother's shoulders to look at me, received a moral lesson and a warning at my expense. As a tiger in his cage wearies the eye by incessantly walking and turning, so I paced my den, and if I could have reached one of the impertinent gazers through the slanting aperture and three-foot wall, I should have throttled him. All these people, said I, and thousands more, will witness my last moments on the scaffold. Stung with this dreadful thought, with rage I searched in my pockets for my penknife, to relieve me at once from my torments and apprehensions, and had I found it, I should certainly have committed suicide. Fortunately, I had left it at home, or it would have been buried at that moment of frenzy in the carotid artery, for, as well as others, I knew exactly where to find it. The crowd at length began to disperse. The windows were left, except now and then an urchin of a boy showed his ragged head at the grill. Worn out with bodily fatigue and mental suffering, I was going to throw myself along upon the cold stones when I saw the face of my own servant, who advanced in haste to the window of the prison, exclaiming with joy, Courage, mon cher maître! Monsieur Talbot n'est pas mort! Not dead! exclaimed I falling unconsciously on my knees and lifting up my clasped hands and haggard eyes to heaven not dead god be praised at least there is a hope that i may escape the crime of murder before i could say any more the mayor entered my cachot with the officers of the police and informed me that a procès verbal had been held that my friend had been able to give the clearest answers to all their questions and that it appeared from the evidence of m talbot himself that it was an affaire d'honneur fairly decided that the brace of pistols found in the water had confirmed his assertions and therefore monsieur continued the mayor whether your friend lives or dies tout a été fait en règle et vous êtes libre so saying he bowed very politely and pointed to the door nor was i so ceremonious as to beg him to show me the way out i ran and flew to the apartment of talbot who had sent my servant to say how much he wished to see me i found him in bed as i entered he held out his hand to me which i covered with kisses and bathed with my tears oh talbot said i can you forgive me he squeezed my hand and from exhaustion let it fall the surgeon led me out of the room, saying, All depends on his being kept quiet. I then learned that he owed his life to two circumstances. The first was my having bound my neckcloth round the wound. The other was that the duel took place below high water mark. The tide was rising when I left him, and the cold waves, as they rippled against his body, had restored him to animation. In this state he was found by his servant, not many minutes before the flood would have covered him for he had not strength to remove out of its way i ascertained also that the ball had entered his liver and had passed out without doing further injury i now dressed myself and devoutly thanking god for his miraculous preservation took my seat by the bedside of the patient which i never quitted until his perfect recovery when this was happily completed i wrote to my father and to clara giving both an exact account of the whole transaction clara undeceived made no scruple of acknowledging her attachment talbot was requested by his father to return home i accompanied him as far as calais where we parted and in a few weeks after i had the pleasure of hearing that my sister had become his wife Left to myself, I returned slowly, and much depressed in spirits, to Quillac, where, ordering post-horses, I threw myself into my travelling carriage, into which my valet had, by my orders, previously placed my luggage. "'Where are you going to, monsieur?' said the valet. "'Au diable,' said I. "'Mais les passeports,' said the man. I felt that I had sufficient passports for the journey I had proposed but, correcting myself, said, to Switzerland. It was the first name that came into my head. 
and i had heard that it was the resort of all my countrymen whose heads hearts lungs or finances were disordered but during my journey i neither saw nor heard anything consequently took no notes which my readers will rejoice at because they will be spared that inexhaustible supply to the trunk makers a tour through france and switzerland i travelled night and day for i could not sleep the allegory of io and the gadfly in the heathen mythology must surely have been intended to represent the being who like myself was tormented by a bad conscience like io i flew and like her was i pursued by the eternal gadfly wherever i went and in vain did i try to escape it i passed the great saint bernard on foot this interested me as i approached it the mountains below and the alps above were one mass of snow and ice and i looked down with contempt on the world below me i took up my abode in the convent for some time my ample contributions to the box in the chapel made me a welcome sojourner beyond the limited period allowed to travellers and i felt less and less inclined to quit the scene my amusement was climbing the most frightful precipices followed by the large and faithful dogs and viewing nature in her wildest and most sublime attire at other times when bodily fatigue required rest i sat down with morbid melancholy in the receptacle for the bodies of those unfortunate persons who had perished in the snow there would i remain for hours musing on their fate the purity of the air admitted neither putrefaction or even decay for a very considerable time and they lay to all appearance as if the breath had even then only quitted them although on touching those who had been there for years they would often crumble into dust roman catholics we know are ever anxious to make converts the prior asked me whether i was not a protestant i replied that i was of no religion which answer was, I believe, much nearer to the truth than any other I could have given. The reply was far more favourable to the hopes of the monks than if I had said I was a heretic or a Moslem. They thought me much more likely to become a convert to their religion, since I had none of my own to oppose to it. The monks immediately arranged themselves in theological order with the whole armour of faith and laid constant siege to me on all sides but i was not inclined to any religion much less to the one i despised i would sooner have turned turk i received a letter from poor unhappy eugenia it was the last she ever wrote it was to acquaint me with the death of her lovely boy who having wandered from the house had fallen into a trout stream where he was found drowned some hours after in her distracted state of mind she could add no more than her blessing and a firm conviction that we should never meet again in this world her letter concluded incoherently and although i should have said in the morning that my mind had not room for another sorrow yet the loss of this sweet boy and the state of his wretched mother found a place in my bosom for a time to the total exclusion of all other cares she requested me to hasten to her without delay if i wished to see her before she died i took leave of the monks and travelled with all speed to paris and thence to calais reaching quillac's hotel i received a shock which although i apprehended danger i was not prepared for it was a letter from eugenia's agent announcing her death she had been seized with a brain fever and had died at a small town in norfolk where she had removed soon after our last unhappy interview the agent concluded his letter by saying that eugenia had bequeathed me all her property which was very considerable and that her last rational words to him were that i was her first and her only love i was now callous to suffering my feelings had been racked to insensibility like a ship in a hurricane the last tremendous sea had swept everything from the decks the vessel was a wreck driving as the storm might chance to direct in the midst of this devastation i looked around me and the only object which presented itself to my mind as worthy of contemplation 
was the tomb which contained the remains of eugenia and her child to that i resolved to repair End of chapter 28section thirty six of the naval officer or scenes in the life and adventures of frank mildmay this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by asterix the naval officer or scenes in the life and adventures of frank mildmay by captain frederick marriott chapter twenty nine with sorrow and repentance true father i trembling come to you song i arrived at the town where poor eugenia had breathed her last and near to which was the cemetery in which her remains were deposited i went to the inn whence after having dismissed my post-boy and ordered my luggage to be taken up to my room i proceeded on foot towards the spot I was informed that the path lay between the church and the bishop's palace. I soon reached it, and, inquiring for the sexton, who lived in a cottage hard by, requested he would lead me to a certain grave, which I indicated by tokens too easily known. "'Oh, you mean the sweet young lady as died of grief from the loss of her little boy? There it is,' continued he, pointing with his finger. The white peacock is now sitting on the headstone of the grave, and the little boy is buried beside it. I approached, while the humble sexton kindly withdrew, that I might, without witnesses, indulge that grief which he saw was the burthen of my aching heart. The bird remained, but without dressing its plumage, without the usual air of surprise and vigilance evinced by domestic fowls when disturbed in their haunts this poor creature was moulting its feathers were rumpled and disordered its tail ragged there was no beauty in the animal which was probably only kept as a variety of the species and it appeared to me as if it had been placed there as a lesson to myself in its modest attire in its melancholy and pensive attitude it seemed with its gaudy plumage to have dismissed the world and its vanities while in mournful silence it surveyed the crowded mementos of eternity this is my office not thine said i apostrophizing the bird which alarmed at my near approach quitted its position and disappeared among the surrounding tombs i sat down and fixing my eyes on the name which the tablet bore ran over in a hurried manner all that part of my career which had been more immediately connected with the history of eugenia i remembered her many virtues her self-devotion for my honour and happiness her concealing herself from me that i might not blast my prospects in life by continuing an intimacy which she saw would end in my ruin her firmness of character her disinterested generosity and the refinement of attachment which made her prefer misery and solitude to her own gratification in the society of the man she loved she had alas but one fault and that fault was loving me i could not drive from my thoughts that it was through my unfortunate and illicit connection with her that i had lost all that made life dear to me at this moment and not once since the morning i awoke from it my singular dream recurred to my mind the thoughts which never had once during my eventful voyage from the bahamas to the cape and thence to england presented themselves in my waking hours must certainly have possessed my brain during sleep why else should it never have occurred to my rational mind that the connection with eugenia would certainly endanger that intended with emily it was eugenia that placed emily in mourning out of my reach and as it were on the top of the ninepin rock here then my dream was explained and i now felt all the horrors of that reality which i thought at the time was no more than the effect of a disordered imagination yet i could not blame eugenia 
the poor girl had fallen a victim to that deplorable and sensual education which i had received in the cockpit of a man of war i i alone was the culprit she was friendless and without a parent to guide her useful steps she fell victim to my ungoverned passions maddened with anguish of head and heart i threw myself violently on the grave i beat my miserable head against the tombstones i called with frantic exclamation on the name of eugenia and at length sank on the turf between the two graves in a state of stupor and exhaustion from which a copious flood of tears in some measure relieved me i was aroused by the sound of wheels and the trampling of horses and looking up i perceived the bishop's carriage and four with outriders passed by the livery and colour of the carriage were certainly what is denominated quiet but there was an appearance of state which indicated that the owner had not entirely renounced the pomps and vanities of this wicked world and my spleen was excited i sweep along i bitterly muttered worthy type indeed of the apostles i like the pride that apes humility is that the way you teach your flock to leave all and follow me i started up suddenly saying to myself i will seek out this man at his palace and see whether i shall be kindly received and consoled or be repulsed by a menial the thought was sudden and being conceived almost in a state of frenzy was instantly executed let me try said i whether a bishop can administer to the mind diseased as well as a country curate i moved on with rapidity to the palace more in a fit of desperation than with a view of seeking peace of mind i rang loudly and vehemently at the gate and asked whether the bishop was at home an elderly domestic who seemed to regard me with astonishment answered in the affirmative and desired me to walk into an ante-room while he announced me to his master i now began to recall my scattered senses which had been wandering and to perceive the absurdity of my conduct i was therefore about to quit the palace into which i had so rudely intruded without waiting for my audience when the servant opened the door and requested me to follow him by what inscrutable means are the designs of providence brought about while i thought i was blindly following the impulse of passion i was in fact guided by unerring wisdom a prey to desperate and irritated feelings i anticipated with malignant pleasure that i should detect hypocrisy that one who ought to set an example should be weighed by me and found wanting instead of which i stumbled on my own salvation where i expected to meet with pride and scorn i met with humility and kindness when i had looked around on the great circle bounded by the visible horizon and could perceive no friendly port in which i might lay my shattered vessel behold it was close at hand i followed the servant with a kind of stupid indifference and was ushered into the presence of a benevolent-looking old man between sixty and seventy years of age his whole external appearance as well as his white hairs commanded respect amounting almost to admiration i was not prepared to speak which he perceived and kindly began as you are a stranger to me i fear from your careworn countenance that it is no common occurrence which has brought you here sit down you seem in distress and if it is in my power to afford you relief you may be assured that i will do so there was in his manner and address an affectionate kindness which overcame me i could neither speak nor look at him but laying my head on the table and hiding my face with my hands i wept bitterly the good bishop allowed me reasonable time to recover myself and with extreme good breeding mildly requested that if it were possible i would confide to him the cause of my affliction be not afraid or ashamed my good lad said he to tell me your sorrows if we have temporal blessings we do not forget that we are but the almoners of the lord we endeavour to follow his example but if i may judge from appearance it is not pecuniary aid you have come to solicit 
no no replied i it is not money that i want but choked with excess of feeling i could say no more this is indeed a more important case than one of mere bodily want said the good man that we might very soon supply but there seems something in your condition which requires our more serious attention i thank the almighty for selecting me to this service and with his blessing we shall not fail of success then going to the door he called to a young lady who i afterwards found was his daughter and holding the door ajar as he spoke that i might not be seen in my distress said caroline my dear write to the duke and beg him to excuse my dining with him to-day tell him that i am kept at home by business of importance and give orders that i be not interrupted on any account he then turned the key in the door and drawing a chair close to mine begged me in the most persuasive manner to tell him everything without reserve in order that he might apply such a remedy as the case seemed to demand i first asked for a glass of wine which was instantly brought he received it at the door and gave it to me with his own hand having drank it i commenced the history of my life in a brief outline and ultimately told him all nearly as much in detail as i have related it to the reader he listened to me with an intense and painful interest questioning me as to my feelings on many important occasions and having at length obtained from me an honest and candid confession without any extenuation my young friend said he your life has been one of peculiar temptation and excess much to deplore much to blame and much to repent of but the state of feeling which induced you to come to me is a proof that you now only require that which with god's help i trust i shall be able to supply it is now late and we both of us require some refreshment i will order in dinner and you must send to the inn for your portmanteau perceiving that i was about to answer i must take no denial resumed he you have placed yourself under my care as your physician and you must follow my prescriptions my duty is as much more important compared to the doctor's as the soul is to the body dinner being served he dismissed the servants as soon as possible and then asked me many questions relative to my family all of which i answered without reserve he once mentioned Miss Somerville, but I was so overcome that he perceived my distress, and filling me a glass of wine, changed the subject. If I thought that any words of mine could do justice to the persuasive discourses of this worthy bishop, I would have benefited the world by making them public. But I could not do this, and I trust that none of my readers will have so much need of them as I had myself i shall therefore briefly state that i remained in the palace ten days in the most perfect seclusion every morning the good bishop dedicated two or three hours to my instruction and improvement he put into my hands one or two books at a time with marks in them indicating the pages which i ought to consult he would have introduced me to his family but this i begged for a time to decline being too much depressed and out of spirits and he indulged me in my request of being allowed to continue in the apartments allotted to me on the seventh morning he came to me and after a short conversation informed me that business would require his absence for two or three days and that he would give me a task to employ me during the short time he should be gone he then put into my hand a work on the sacrament this said he i am sure you will read with particular attention so that on my return i may invite you to the feast i trembled as i opened the book fear not mr mildmay said he i tell you from what i see of your symptoms that the cure will be complete having said this he gave me his blessing and departed he returned exactly at the end of three days and after a short examination said he would allow me to receive the sacrament and that the holy ceremony should take place in his own room privately well knowing how much affected i should be 
he brought in the bread and wine and having consecrated and partaken of them himself agreeably to the forms prescribed he made a short extempore prayer on my behalf when he had done this he advanced towards me and presented the bread my blood curdled as i took it in my mouth and when i had tasted the wine the type of the blood of that saviour whose wounds i had so often opened afresh in my guilty career and yet upon the merits of which i now relied for pardon i felt a combined sensation of love gratitude and joy a lightness and buoyancy of spirits as if i could have left the earth below me disburdened of a weight that had till then crushed me to the ground i felt that i had faith that i was a new man and that my sins were forgiven and dropping my head on the side of the table i remained some minutes in grateful and fervent prayer the service being ended i hastened to express my acknowledgments to my venerable friend i am but the humble instrument my dear young friend said the bishop let us both give thanks to the almighty searcher of hearts let us hope that the work is perfect for then you will be the occasion of joy in heaven and now continued he let me ask you one question do you feel in that state of mind that you could bear any affliction which might befall you without repining i trust sir answered i that i could bear it not only cheerfully but thankfully and i now acknowledge that it is good for me that i have been in trouble then all is right said he and with such feelings i may venture to give you this letter which i promised the writer to deliver with my own hand as soon as my eye caught the superscription gracious heaven exclaimed i it is from my emily even so said the bishop i tore it open it contained only six lines which were as follows our mutual kind friend the bishop has proved to me how proud and how foolish i have been forgive me dear frank for i too have suffered much and come as soon as possible to your ever affectionate emily this then was the object of the venerable bishop's absence bending beneath age and infirmity he had undertaken a journey of three hundred miles in order to ensure the temporal as well as eternal welfare of a perfect stranger to effect a reconciliation without which he saw that my worldly happiness was incomplete i was afterwards informed that notwithstanding the weight of his character and holy office he had found emily more decided in her rejection than he had anticipated and it was not until he had sharply rebuked her for her pride and unforgiving temper that she could be brought to listen with patience to his arguments but having at length convinced her that the tenure of her own hopes depended on her forgiveness of others she relented acknowledged the truth of his remarks and her undiminished affection for me while she made this confession she was in the same position before the bishop that i was when i received her letter on my knees and in tears he gave me his hand raised me up and now my young friend said he let me give you one caution i hope and i trust that your repentance is sincere if it be not the guilt must rest on your head but i trust in god that all is as it should be i will not therefore detain you any longer you must be impatient to be gone refreshment is prepared for you my horses will take you the first stage have you funds sufficient to carry you through for it is a long journey as my old bones can testify i assured him that i was sufficiently provided and expressing my thanks for his kindness wished that it was in my power to prove my gratitude put me to the test my lord said i if you possibly can well then replied he i will when the day for your union with miss somerville is fixed allow me to have the pleasure of joining your hands should it please god to spare me so long i have removed the disease but i must trust to somebody else to watch and prevent a relapse and believe me my dear friend however well inclined a man may be to keep in the straight path he gains no little support from the guidance and example of a lovely and virtuous woman 
I promised readily all he asked, and, having finished a slight lunch, again shook hands with the worthy prelate, jumped into my carriage, and drove off. I travelled all night, and the next day was in the society of those I loved, and who had ever loved me, in spite of all my perverseness and folly. A few weeks after, Emily and I were united by the venerable bishop, who, with much emotion, gave us his benediction, and, as the prayer of the righteous man availeth much, I felt that it was recorded in our favour in heaven. Mr. Somerville gave the bride away. My father, with Talbot and Clara, were present, and the whole of us, after all my strange vicissitudes, were deeply affected at this reconciliation and union. End of chapter 29 Recorded by Asterix End of the Naval Officer or Scenes in the Life and Adventures of Frank Mildmay by Captain Frederick Marriott